Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our time together uh, today is going to be journeying through the book of Genesis yet again. Um, Each week, throughout our summer sermon series, we unpack another story in the account of beginnings. That's what the word Genesis means. It means beginnings. And so we started in week one, and I'm not going to go into too much depth on any of these, but week one, we talked about Genesis chapter one, the creation account. And we talked about how God made everything, the land, the animals, the plants, and the waters, and everything in them was good. And as God made everything, he stepped back, and he, on the very last day, he said, it is very good. In week one, we talked about how God created it all, and it started out formless and void, and God put order into chaos. And so when our world falls into chaos, it is moving away from God's original intentions. Uh, The second week, we talked about the fall. The fall isn't the beginning of everything. Rather, it's the beginning of sin. And so in in week two, we talked about how Adam and Eve were walking through the garden, and Satan decides he wants Adam and Eve to eat of this particular fruit, the one tree that God said the fruit is off limits. A million yeses and one no, and Satan knew that they couldn't eat the fruit if they weren't close to the tree. And so he lures them into the tree. Giving in to a little, they end up biting off a lot, and they end up falling for this temptation. Week three... We talked about Cain and Abel. And in the account of Cain and Abel, we found two brothers who loved each other dearly, but yet were brothers. And there was sin that was between them. And Cain was a worker of the field, and Abel was a raiser of sheep. And so Cain and Abel one day brought an offering to the Lord. Abel brought the best of his flock and gave it to God as an offering. Cain, however, brought some of the vegetation and offered it to God. God had found favor in the gift that Abel gave, but not so much in the gift of Cain because it was just as much a matter of the gift as it was the heart of the giver. And so Cain grew jealous, believing that injustice happened. He killed his own brother. And our theme for that week was sin never fixes injustice. Then we moved ahead in the book of Genesis to chapter 6, 7, and 8, and 9. And we read the account of the flood. And this is the time when it says, every intention of every man's heart was always evil all the time. And God looks at the world and he says, ooh, yucky. That's the Derek version of what it says. But he really says that he regrets creating anything and he wants to get rid of it all. And so he sends a flood to wipe out the entire earth, and he saves portion of the creation. He saves Noah and his family, eight people in all. And then he brings one pair of every animal and seven pairs of some, and he saves them into the ark, and then it rains, and it floods, and the ark rises, and they are there for what feels like forever. Until one day the rain stops and the waters dry up, and the boat comes to rest on top of a mountain And God opens the door, and they come out, and they look, and they realize that, wow, things have changed a lot. And as they disembark from the ark, they are the very same ones who entered it, which means they are some from the population who were sinful, just like the problem that entered into the ark. That same sin-filled problem exited the ark And yet they worshiped God on the other side of the storm, and God put his bow in the sky, and he says, this is my sign of my grace to you. This is my sign of my peace among you, and this is my demonstration of love toward you. And we talked about that last week. Uh, So today we jump ahead to the next portion of the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 11. And Genesis chapter 11 is the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel, some call it Babel, but I like to call it Babel because it was built in the land of what we call Babylon, and so it's the Tower of Babel. And as these people get out of the ark, Noah and his family, they get out of the ark and they begin to to multiply. And in chapter 9 of Genesis, God says, "Be, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Not fill this area, but rather fill all of the earth. And so that means he wants them to to have children and grow a lineage and establish a heritage and move all over the world. 
Don't stay packed into one little place, but instead, in chapter 11, we realize that before they scattered everywhere, they had a plan. And their plan was this. We will stay together. And so in Genesis chapter 11, I want to read the beginning of this. You're probably wondering if you've got your Bible right in front of you, why are you using uh, the one on your phone? I'm doing it because I have a different verse I'm going to read out of my Bible in a minute. So it says in here, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. Noah and his family got out of the ark. They had one language and one speech. Anybody here ever been to Texas? Do they talk the same as you talk? No. I mean, they say the same words but they definitely don't sound like Ohioans, right? Ever been to Boston? They don't sound like Ohioans either. And so what it says here in Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, is that everybody sounded the same. Not only did they have the same language, but they also had the same dialect and the same speech patterns. And so the words were the same, and the sounds were the same, and the sentence structure was the same, and everything was the same. And so they understood each other perfectly. Now the whole earth had one language, and the same words, or the same speech. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. This is the area around Babylon. If you've ever seen um, if you've ever seen pictures of the hanging, the hanging flower baskets or whatever they are, one of the seven wonders of the world, if you look in the background of those paintings, you'll see remnants of the Tower of Babel in the background. So they're in the land of Shinar, a land that is rich, a land that is rich with resources, a land that, that has lush grounds, a land that has all the stuff they could possibly want. They weren't going into a desert. They weren't going into the middle of nowhere. They wanted to go to a great place. And then they said, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. Now, hold on a minute. In chapter 9, God said, Don't go together. Go apart. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, God says, Now that you're out of the ark, now that I've saved you, I want you to grow and to multiply and fill the earth. But instead, Noah's descendants decide that they are not going to fill the earth. Rather, they're going to establish their own location. And so they gather themselves together. And they hold themselves together. And they say, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. They make bricks to build this city and this tower. I, I think we can learn a lot just from this portion of our text. Because every intention of every man's heart was always evil all the time. And then God saved eight of them, and they got out of the boat, and they, they multiplied in number, and that every intention of every man's heart was always evil all the time, kept multiplying with the generations that would come. And when you take evil intentions and you put them together, you can, uh, you can see how it's going to work evil. And the evil begin to grow. Let us make bricks and build ourselves a tower. Now, the reasoning to build a tower was kind of interesting. We want a tower that reaches the heavens. We want to make our name memorable and great for future generations. And we want to build a city so that we never have to separate. Now, what's interesting about those three reasons are all three of those reasons go directly against God's commands. All three of their reasonings are completely contrary to everything we find everywhere else in Scripture. Let us build a tower so that we can exalt ourselves. Worship the Lord and Him alone shall you serve, the Scripture says. They wanted to be worshipped. They wanted to be elevated. They practiced this self-exaltation. It was pride in themselves. But not only that, they wanted to leave their own legacy. 
They didn't want to proclaim the name of God and make God's name great. They wanted to proclaim their own name and make themselves a lasting heritage. They wanted their own genealogy, their own legacy to be built. And finally, they didn't want to disperse around the earth. If you remember in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, where, and even chapter 3, God says, be fruitful and multiply, and he says, fill the earth and subdue it. Fill the earth, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, he says in Genesis 1 and 2. And he wants, he wants Adam and Eve to fill the earth, not just this little portion of it, but the entire thing. God is a God of scattering his people so that generations beyond will be able to know the message. And yet when we gather ourselves together and we stay together and we refuse to scatter, the intentions of our heart are only magnified. And so God took them and he confused their languages, it says. Now, I, I want you to think for a minute about what's happening in our text for this morning. The Israelites are, are the, the people of God, not Israelites. The people of God, Israelites aren't even around yet. The people of God are there, and they're all gathered in this place, and they all go, and they say, let's build this city. And so they start to make bricks. They don't, make, they don't use stone. Stone throughout the Bible is what's used to honor and glorify God. Bricks are oftentimes what's used to glorify men. And so they man-make their bricks, the things of their own hands. They form them, and they build them, and they make them, and they each take their bricks that they've made, and they lay them to build a city for their own glory, a city for their own safety. You see, they thought, they thought that the brick that they built would be used to provide them safety and protection but really it gave a false sense of security. What are the bricks that we use in our own day to provide a false sense of safety and security? I'm pretty sure that none of the, the people of God in, in this time, none of them said, well, I want to just outright walk away from God. Many of them probably thought, you know, one brick isn't gonna hurt anything. You ever thought that? Just, just one little time it's not gonna hurt anything? If I just give in on this little thing, it's no big deal. What are the bricks that we use to build the tower in our own life? What are the bricks that we take and we place upon this tower and we try to build a name for ourselves? What are the bricks that we use in our own world to try to establish a name for ourselves to protect us, to provide a false sense of safety and security? What are the bricks that we build our tower with today? I think a lot of times we, we use money as a brick and we put our intentions into our capital. And we think that the more money we have, the, the better protected we are. And that becomes another brick in the tower of our own glory. I think a lot of times we, we use our, our home as, as an element of safety and security. We find our comforts, the things that make us comfortable, we place there. I don't like to get outside of my box, and so I'm going to use that as another brick in my tower. There's more. There's so many more things that we use as bricks to build our city and our tower. We have to realize that those bricks, while they don't do any harm in and of themselves right now, but the more we amass those bricks on top of one another, the more and the more and the more we build this tower that is about us and not about the cross. So God scatters them across the earth, and he confuses their language. He tells them that if you are going to join together in pure evil against me, I will just scatter you everywhere. And there they go. The very first evangelism explosion program ever was when God confused their languages and sent them around the world. But notice... The things they wanted to do were the things that God promised to do for them. If you're a studier of the book of Revelation, you'll realize that everything they wanted to do, God was going to do in the end. They wanted to build a tower to make themselves the, the most powerful around. And in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, it says that everyone will bow at the very name of Jesus and that the Father will subject everything under the authority of the Son. No tower we build will be greater than the power of Christ. 
They wanted to make their name the most powerful name around. Jesus says, you're not going to make your name great. You're not going to make your name the most powerful name. I'm going to give you a new name. In one of the letters to the seven churches, we receive a new name, a name only known by God. That is the name that will elevate us to a new level, not a name we build for ourselves. And any time we join ourselves together in an effort that is not based solely in the message of the gospel, it will end in evil. And so in the book of Revelation, we find that God will call us together. And not until God calls us together to come back to him should all of the earth speak the same voice and enact the same actions. Because every time it happens in history, it turns out very, very badly. And so here's God, and he looks down, and they're building a tower. This is one of my fun moments, right? I love, I love it when God plays with people. Not in a bad way. No, that, that sounds really bad. I think God likes to have a little bit of fun. And so here, here these people are, right? They're going to build a tower that reaches the heavens. They think all these cool things they're bringing to God are going to amount to something. And they're going to build this tower, and it's going to reach heaven. And they're going to be fantastic and wonderful. And everybody's going to remember them, and everyone's going to draw to them. And God, in the, his trinity, he says, let's go down and check this thing out that they're building. Now, now, now think about this for a minute. Ready? They're, the, God is in heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're building a tower to reach the heavens, and, and God can see it. But he's playing around a little bit right now, and he, he goes down, and he goes, huh, well, that's cute. When are you going to start building? Look at this cute little thing. I mean, here they are. They're amassing this huge tower. They're building this gigantic system that's all about themselves and their own security and safety, and God goes, that's, that's the best you got? Huh, interesting. Interesting. So if we're not supposed to collectively join our forces to build a city, and if we're not supposed to everyone do the same thing and act the same way and speak the same words and be the same person and look the same in all of our, in all of our, our parts and pieces and everything else, what are we supposed to do? What does God call us to do? God calls us to be his children. God calls us to come to him. God calls us to return. One of my favorite lines that is spoken in the Old Testament as it relates to the situation that our world is in right now. Everyone saying that their brick is the best brick to use. Everyone saying that we need to use this brick when no one is really using the stone, the rock, which is Christ. We can build with bricks, but they're not going to get us anywhere. So what does God say? Second Chronicles chapter 7. If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves. If my people. Okay, so this is fantastic. Ready? This is what God says. God says, if you call yourself my people, if you claim my name upon you, if, like if this is you, if this is really legitimately you, not just in word, but in action and in, de in, in deed, if this is you, and if we humble ourselves and pray and seek God's face and turn from our wicked, <clears throat> wicked ways. Now, hold on a minute. God built this all the way back in 2 Chronicles. Now, I don't know if you know anything about the Bible. If you're not really a Bible person, I you just go through this real quick with you. 2 Chronicles is right here. Very, this is near the very beginning of the Bible. Like, this is long before a lot of the stuff we know in our world today. It's way at the beginning. There's a whole lot of stuff that happens after that where the people of God just don't follow those rules. There's a whole lot of stuff that happens after that where, where, the, where the people who call themselves followers of God don't do what God's about to tell them, and it usually ends badly. There's a whole lot of stuff that happens <clears throat> right here before the book of Revelation and after the rest of the Bible, and, and there's a lot of stuff that happens in here and between here that we're living today. And this, this promise, God says, is applicable right now in our day to day. So check out what God says. If my people who are called by my name, my name, Christian, follower of Christ, 
disciple, lover of Jesus, worshiper of God. Use the term that you want. It's okay. If my people who are called by my name would just humble themselves and get off their high horse and come back to me, this is God's word, this isn't mine, so don't shoot the messenger. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then guess what God's going to do? Guess, ready? This is great. This is fantastic. I absolutely love what God's about to do here. He's about to say, you can fix this. Go ahead. Build your tower, and I'll wait. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and quit setting themselves up as God and would return to me, would pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then get this, I will hear them. I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. I will heal from heaven. I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I don't know about you. There's a lot of brokenness in our world right now. There's a lot of healing that needs to happen in our land. In our land as residents of the greater Columbus area, in our land as residents of Ohio, in our land as Americans, in our land as citizens of this earth. And if we think that we can fix it, we are sadly, sadly mistaken. The Bible tells us there's only one fix for the brokenness in our world. There's only one solution for the problem we are facing, and it's stop playing God. God clearly states, I am God. He says elsewhere, where were you when I hung the heavens? Where were you when I stretched out the expanse of the universe? Where were you? You weren't in existence, but I was because I'd done it all. If my people, who are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive them and will heal their land. Do we want to heal the injustice that's happening between races? The only color we should see is the red that flowed from Jesus' side because that color is the color that brings all other colors together. If we want to heal a disease that's ravaging our world in some manner of speaking, we humble ourselves and we return to the Lord and let God heal our land. If we want to heal the pains of broken relationships, of financial struggle, of a world that is spiraling seemingly out of control, we humble ourselves and we let God fix what we have broken. The cycle of Scripture is judgment, mercy, judgment, mercy, judgment, mercy, judgment, mercy. God judges and is merciful. He passes judgment and he's merciful. Perhaps when we repent, we get to rest in the merciful arms of our Savior again. But while we play God, judgment is ours. Judgment's on us when we play God. Friends in Christ, I think it's time that we, as people called by God's name, followers of the scriptures, people who say we believe in what this book teaches, it's probably time we start living what this book teaches. Let God heal our broken land. Let God offer the solution to the problems we face, no matter what they are. And perhaps when prayer is no longer our last line of defense and it becomes our first line of offense, we'll see the healing we need. But for so many, even in the church, prayer has moved from our first line of offense to our last line of defense. If you have a great offense, your defense really doesn't have to do a lot of work. See, friends, Christ is the one who is the victor. Christ has already won this battle. We may be the church militant, but in Christ we have already been granted the victory. Therefore, 
we are the church triumphant. May we always stand upon the reality that Christ is victor over all. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will hear them in heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. Would you pray with me? Gracious Father, we have built towers out of our own making. We have crafted images and methods of our own safety and control. And we've tried to rob you of glory. Lord, I pray today that you would humble us, that you would scatter us where we need to be scattered and then bring us back again. Lord, I pray that you would allow us to see where you have called us to go and that you would give us the conviction to live as people called by your name. Father, I pray that as we call upon you, as we humble ourselves before you, that you would heal our land. Father, we give this and all to you. In the merciful name of your son, Jesus, amen.